name is Ami Nagani. I'm a mechanical engineer from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I specialize in product development. I have 10 years of industry experience. Uh, four of those are in injection molded plastics. And then Arvind, Arvind Christian, he is a manufacturing engineer and he has a specialty with additive manufacturing and he's also our simulation specialist. And both of us are here in the Go Engineer Dallas office. So um, the audience, you know, for this webinar is going to be um, the beginner to moderate range. Um, we do have some really neat tech tips and design recommendations. So even if you're in the moderate range, I think there's something that all of you can walk away with. Um, so we hope you stay for the whole presentation. So Arvind, can you uh, get us started with uh, just an introduction? Yeah, so injection molding is a manufacturing process. The way it works is the machine that you see on the right bottom, you have a hopper on the, uh, you have uh, pellets that you put in, and then you have the barrel and the screw that heats the pellets up because of heating elements and friction. And uh, they get heated up, they become molten plastic. And then you have the mold where the molten plastic goes into and uh, it is, your, your pipe is going to be injected into it with the molten plastic. Uh, the pipe cools down once it occupies all the space inside. And once it's cooled and solidified, it is then ejected out and the pipe drops in place. <clears throat> this is the injection molding process. Just some quick comments about it. Uh, because of the way it's set up, the mold has a high upfront cost. Um, usually it takes a little bit to make it. But once you do that and once you know the process of doing that, the cost per part is relatively low. And that's what is very attractive about injection molding for mass manufacturing. It has excellent reproducibility, very good surface finish. But there's a lot of parameters that affect how a plastics part design is going to be um, is going to be made. That's what we're going to be talking about today and then we will also talk about some of the tips to um, to improve your part design. So your typical development process, you have an initial concept and then you create a detailed product design with uh, dimensions and specs and how it's going to look. You also do some validation to ensure that wherever you're going to use the part, it is going to be structurally viable for that. Uh, one thing that may be overlooked that is very important is the design for manufacturing. So Ami, tell us a little bit about this. We initially start with a detailed design and specs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what's particular about plastic part design is you know, you have this expectation. You design it and then you're like, okay, and this is what I'm going to get. But then this is what happens. And, you know, a lot of that can be just due to um, lack of knowledge or experience. There's a lot of things that go into um, plastic part design and mold design. Um, you know, if you do 3D printing, you know, after you get to a certain point in your design cycle, you'll do some 3D printing. And 3D printing proves out kind of the form fit function, but there are some things that it's not going to be able to predict. It's not going to be able to predict the manufacturing flaws. So we're going to talk about some of those today. From an injection molding standpoint, there are just so many things that affect how the final part looks like. The fill time that you select, the maximum pressure of the machine that you have, material composition, gate location, thermal expansion coefficient, uh, viscosity of the materials, all of these uh, play a big part in the plastics part you have itself. From a mold perspective, you have other things like pressure settings, packing time, cooling time, cooling lines. Uh, so there's a lot that goes into it. And hence, injection molding, while it has a lot of benefits, it's important to understand the process that governs how it works. Yeah, so from a managerial perspective, you know, it should be known that 
you know, a typical mechanical engineering curriculum. It doesn't necessarily have a specific plastics course. So a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people assume, you know, you being the technical resource that you probably know this already, and that's not the case. Uh, but there are other, there are ways to increase your knowledge on this topic. You know, you can network with other engineers. Um, if you have communication with a tool maker, that will really help. Um, I think you can learn a lot just by looking at, you know, flawed plastic parts. So just um, plastic parts with a lot of um, just flaws in them, whether they're short shots. And we'll talk about some of this terminology. Um, but that's how you can learn. But I, I actually pulled a few, you know, curricula from the websites of uh, various engineering schools. And still, even today, none of them have an injection molding or a plastics course. We really just learn it from a material science perspective, a microscopic process, but not at this top level design stage. Excellent. Another consideration to keep in mind uh, when manufacturing plastics, again, since we're talking from a managerial perspective, is the fact that 80% of molds uh, and the subsequent injection molded parts are currently made internationally. Uh, this is uh, very good because it reduces the cost of tools and labor. Uh, a couple of things to keep in mind when you do this is uh, communication. A lot of people uh, speak different languages all over the world. That's one thing to keep in mind. If you plan to locally visit, it uh, may be a 20-hour flight to get to a different part of the world. They're speaking a different language, time differences. Uh, also, sometimes some countries have blackout days because of power outages or different festive schedules. These are just some of the things that you would want to keep in mind uh, as you decide whether you want to manufacture domestically or uh, through an international country. Yeah. So when we talk about injection molding, there's two major topics we're talking about. We're talking about mold design and part design. And we're focusing mainly on part design, but a lot of the choices we're making here do affect mold design. So um, we'll be mentioning, you know, where it affects one or the other. But it's important to know kind of that relationship. So let's go on into some of our design fundamentals. So rule number one is that you want a uniform wall thickness. Um, that's kind of the general rule. And the reason you want a uniform wall thickness is because you want the molten material to flow evenly throughout the cavity. Um, so Arvind, can you show us um, this in the analysis software, you know, what this looks like? What are we compromising? What are the trade-offs if, if we don't have a consistent wall thickness? Absolutely. So let's go ahead and switch to SOLIDWORKS real quick. And uh, here we have a model of a very simple plastic part design. And uh, if you look through the cross section, you can see the constant thickness that we have. So in this case, we've done a very simple injection uh, molding analysis where we specified uh, the gate location right in the middle. And uh, once we run this, we're going to notice that uh, this is how it fills. Uh, so you see the molten plastic going from that initial gate location uh, to the extremities of the pipe. Uh, one more thing to keep in mind is the pressure at the end of fill. So in this case, again, for this specific design, is about 350 PSI. Um, but for the same thing, let's say we go ahead, I'm going to switch configurations to another model where we now go to a multi-wall thickness design. Uh, and this time, if I look at the cross-section, you're going to see the differences in the thickness. So just for that thickness change, now you could have initially thought about this from a structural perspective that you're going to be saving weight if you do this. But if you look at it from uh, a plastics manufacturing perspective, you notice that now when you look at the pressure at the end of fill, you've gone up almost three times in terms of the amount of pressure needed. A lot of times there's a defect called short shots that we talk about soon, where uh, sometimes the amount of pressure needed, you would need a bigger machine because the current machine you're using doesn't go to the pressure that you have set uh, because of the thinner uh, constraints. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing that you would want to keep in mind. Hmm. I wouldn't have thought that uh, just a small change like that would, you know, increase that threefold. So that was really interesting to see. 
Um, okay, so the next rule is adding drafts or taper, if you're not familiar with that term. Um, so I have this image of a cupcake because I think it really clearly explains what's happening. You know, if you are baking a cupcake, the edges, I mean, the, the side walls are drafted or tapered. And the reason that is is because once the cupcake is cooled after baking, it you can remove it from the mold. And that's what you want. You want to be able to easily remove the part from the mold. So even though draft itself doesn't affect the part, <coughs> it does affect your cycle time. Um, you know, you want to be able to produce multiple parts in a cycle, and uh, you know, there's different cycle times depending on the size of your part. But you know, draft is important. Uh, some people specify that they want, you know, a minimum of three degrees. I mean, it really varies tool maker to tool maker. To oh, sorry, go ahead. To to kind of add to what Ami was saying, uh, when we saw the initial animation of the mold, to ensure that those two molds. Uh, separate together, you want adequate draft so that that happens. Another functional reason is the same pressure that we spoke about. Um, I want to just quickly bring up another example where um, the same model that we looked at, we're looking at the same model again, but this time without any draft. And uh, even in this case with the same setup, you're going to notice that the pressure required has gone up about 20% from the previous example. So not as bad as the thickness change, but it's still gone up 20% just because of not adding draft. So the, the idea of having the molten plastic flow through, the, flow through to different regions of the model is very important as you consider uh, draft angles in your plastic part design. Excellent. Okay, so rule number three, um, mounting bosses are about 60% of the thickness. And I say about, it's not quite an exact science, but it's not, it's definitely not as much as your general wall thickness. Um, you know, you want to um, have it less than the general wall thickness because you want to reduce sink marks on the other side of the part. So the image shows how, you know, when you have a really heavy wall thickness on a mounting box, you can create some cosmetic flaws. Um, you know, it really depends on, um, you know, kind of the final, you know, application of that part. But in general, you don't want to compromise the integrity of that box either. Um, so it's good to stay within reason. And your analysis tool can tell you whether it needs to be 60% or 55 or, you know, you can actually run the analysis a few times to really get that sweet spot of uh, what that thickness needs to be for those inner features. And the same thing applies for ribs. So ribs are, you know, often structural features. But if you don't choose the right thickness, you can also get sink marks on those as well. So you might have seen, um, you know, like a plastic seat with um, um, just some vertical or horizontal lines on it from the ribs underneath. And that's because the rib thickness was probably not the, the right thickness for that part or that cooling time. So Arvind, do you have an example you can show us of, um, you know, kind of the structural rigidity of a part with ribs? Absolutely. Let's go ahead and switch back to SOLIDWORKS. This time we'll look at uh, the structural aspects of this. So we'll do a structural simulation. So in this case we have a very simple box again and uh, let's look at an example of the stiffness or a frequency analysis uh, with this part. Uh, I'm looking at this first motor vibration which gives me about 450 hertz um, for the frequency, the first natural frequency. And the second one is uh, about 523 hertz. The same thing, if I go ahead and add a couple of ribs, so I'm going to add three ribs on each side, uh, something very small, you're not adding too much weight to the structure, but at the same time, if I go ahead and now look at the uh, frequency, this first one has increased about 10% to almost 500. And the second one has increased almost 15% to almost 600 hertz. So making slight design changes with ribs following the design guidelines that Ami just spoke about can help increase the structural stiffness of your uh, model or of your design significantly. Cool. 
Okay, so we have another rule, which is to avoid undercut. Uh, you can't always avoid undercut. Depends on the uh, design demands. But there are a lot of creative ways to get around undercuts. So undercuts are um, basically features on the side of your part. Um, and the side of your part is kind of relative depending on where your parting line is. And um, you know, there's some terminology there. But basically, if you have a top and a bottom, but you have a, a hole like what's shown in this uh, illustration, um, what that means is when this part is molded, when you're injecting the molten material into this cavity, you've got to have a placeholder for this hole so that the material will flow around it. Now, in order for that to happen, you have to have some kind of side action or camera tooling. Uh, it's basically a whole other section of your tool. So basically, you have to remove that section and then separate the cavity to release the part. So it's not only more tooling, but it's a second step in the process to release the part. So you're increasing your cycle time. You're increasing the cost of the mold. So with some creative, um, uh, if you implement some creative ways to get around that, you can keep the cost of the, of the mold or of the tool very low. So it's really important to uh, avoid that. OK. So, so Ervin, we talked about some rules. These are things that you really want to abide by when you're designing a part. But there's a lot of things that you don't see if you're a first-time plastics part designer. You wouldn't even know about. And then you get your first part, and you'd be like, what is this? And how did this happen? So can you tell us what some of those things are? What are some of these manufacturing defects that I wouldn't know to expect? Yeah, so let's go ahead and look at just a few more uh, plastics injection molding terms that uh, you may want to think about as you as you consider your design. So uh, once again, we're going to look at a thermostat casing which has been injection molded. Uh, you have the Go Engineer logo on one side and all of that fun stuff. Now, uh, in this case, our kind of injection location is over there, and we're going to go ahead and. Uh, quickly run the animation for how this part fills up. Uh, you can see that this flow current coming in from the left and another one coming in from the right meets somewhere here in the middle. And that causes what's called a well line. A well line is created uh, because when you have multiple flow fronts meet up. And uh, this is because of imperfections in from a microscopic level when you have two different fronts just meet up. And usually you want, these are unavoidable in any plastics part, but you want to avoid them in being at structurally critical areas. So if you have a structurally critical region, look at moving the gate location or uh, moving the well line in another manner to ensure that the structural integrity of the part remains. Another thing is air traps. When we looked at that initial animation of how an injection molding machine works, uh, <clears throat> when there's a gap between the molds uh, before the plastic is filled in, there's actually air over there. So when you fill the plastic in, where does that air go? That air needs to be vented out, and that is done through what's called venting lines. Now these venting lines, you want them to be placed in regions such that they're on the top or the outside of your part. So you want these air traps to uh, to be at the outside of the part. So if you have an air trap right in the inside in the middle, then it's very hard to have a, a venting line go over there. So to make the manufacturing process a little bit easier, you want your air traps to be on the outside. Similar to that, sink marks and another one where if you have abrupt changes in thickness because of the thermal profile and the longer time for something to cool down, uh, a sink point is, is going to be generated in those regions uh, that you want to take into account. Another place where you typically want to avoid uh, structurally sensitive areas to have these at. We spoke briefly about shot shots in the previous example. If the pressure in the injection molding machine is not enough, then shot shots are developed, which you want to avoid. So have adequate thicknesses for the part. Over to you, Ami. Okay, so. We talked about some design rules. We talked about some of the weird curveballs that we might expect. Um, so let's talk about improving our design. Um, you know, injection molded parts 
often have alignment issues. And so in this example on the left, you know, you've got a lid and a box and yeah, you can design it for, you know, a perfect circumstance, but if you put in like um, a chamfer or a fillet for a good lead-in, that would help. Um, but, you know, again, there are alignment issues often with plastic parts. So Arvind, can you tell us a little bit more about why that might be? Yeah, so these, so the little second diagram that you see in the, in the bottom, you see the, uh, the, the, the chamfer cuts that give it more room to kind of sit into place. And you're, you're having this additional room because you want to account for warpage as one of the potential imperfections because of uh, injection molding. So let's go in and look at uh, warpage real quick. So in this case, so again, warpage is an effect of the temperature difference as your molten metal or, or as your molten plastic cools down and solidifies, it's going to shrink and you're going to see warpage effects if there's uneven shrinkage. In this case, now keep in mind that the warpage of this part, I have uh, uh, magnified it about five times so that you can see it from the naked eye. But you see that the warpage of this part is relatively uniform and that is held by the location of the gate being relatively central. Now as we're talking about this, uh, this uniform shrinkage can be accounted for by having a slightly bigger mold, um, but there might be another case where the warpage is not uniform. Let's look at another example, this uh, propeller for example, where we look at the warpage in this case and you're going to notice that uh, one side warps a little bit more than the other one and that's going to have a direct impact on the performance of this. So, once again, um, you know, this one is not magnified and you see that one region is going to be warping a little bit more than the other and because of that, it's going to directly affect the performance of this. Mm. I just wanted to hit a couple of things more. Uh, this is one reason why 3D printing is useful, that you can kind of test some of this beforehand. Um, also, something like Solvus Plastics helps you um, export the warp shape itself so that you can test your designs based on the warp shape and you know if something's going to work even with a little bit of warpage or not. So you can test form, fit, and function with a 3D printed design. Oh, so you can save your deformed shape as a 3D model and print that for your test. Absolutely. And, okay. Yeah, and you can run tests and make sure that the form, fit, and function of it works well with an SDL 3D printed model and, and make sure that, uh, that you counteract warpage and the effects are minimal enough for your design to still go through. Okay, okay. So um, before we go on, I just wanted to share a few more alignment examples. So um, just a couple of solutions. So the one on the left is a stepped edge with a little feature to help keep those aligned. I really like that example. Um, you can probably create that feature along the inner perimeter of some kind of a enclosure. Um, and then a box like this where you have holes and mounting boxes, you can um, slot one of the holes a little bit to accommodate for a little uh, slot in there. And then that minor warpage won't be so obvious or evident to the naked eye. And then this one I really like. So these are three different examples of assembly and alignment. So in the first one, um, you have maybe like a screw-on or a twist-on assembly, um, but they've molded in like arrow indicators. So that gives your end user some feedback as kind of what the final position should be. Uh, the middle one gives your user kind of auditory feedback when you snap something in place. Um, once it gets past that stepped edge, um, then they understand that it's kind of locked in place. Um, and we do have a SOLIDWORKS design feature for uh, snap hooks and mounting bosses and things like that. So it's not a feature you would have to design from scratch. Um, and then in the third example, it kind of builds on the second one where you have this uh, snap groove and you snap it on, but you also have another feature to you know, dictate the orientation. So it keeps it from rotating around that boss once it snaps shut. Okay, orientation of components is another thing. And, you know, we, we need to be more intentional about our design decisions. You know, sometimes you do want a part to be attached only in one manner and not have any other possibilities. 
Um, but sometimes you want to give your end user multiple possibilities. So you just have to think about that in an assembly perspective of what, what is it that you want for your end user or your customer. Um, labeling and instructions. So Arvin, if you turn over like a plastic part, what are some things you see sometimes? Um, oftentimes you see like a sticker with some instructions on it or you know do's and don'ts. Sometimes you have like a, an attached instruction sheet that comes with it mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, one of the things I only see is like the recycling logo or the recycling code. And maybe I'll see like the company who manufactured it. I, there's a lot of times where I want to know who manufactured something and I don't even see that information. So I don't even know where to get another one. So some people aren't even putting their, their name or their brand on their product. But beyond that, you can give your end user um, just a much better experience by integrating instructions or diagrams. If you're doing an electronic enclosure, you can kind of emboss you know, kind of the circuit path or, you know, whatever the diagram might show, indicators, text, um, all of that can be very useful depending on the application, you know, whether it's a consumer product or a component uh, for your assemblers, but you can speed up the manufacturing process by adding that value. Um, just to add real quick, you want to make sure that you have fillets and chamfers in those regions oh, yeah, good point. so that there's easy flow of the plastic even in some of those intricate areas, um, so yeah. Right, yeah, because I think that also kind of uh, kind of contradicts what we were saying about wall thickness, right? If you emboss something in those regions, you have a variation of wall thickness. So to kind of ease the material in there, you want to make sure you have chamfers and fillets. Um, really, fillets are better, obviously, but um, you want that material to flow better in those small regions. Okay, eliminating hardware. So why is eliminating hardware important? Uh, hardware introduces a lot of labor costs. Um, you know, and labor costs significantly increase your part design. So while the tool is very expensive, labor cost is also expensive because that's repetitive. Tooling is a one-time cost where labor is repetitive with each part or each assembly. Um, you also don't want to, you want to avoid, you know, having to manage that hardware the Ziploc bags or staples to attach it or instructions for the hardware. I mean, kind of the sky's the limit with the problems with hardware. Um, and, and you can really avoid a lot of end user frustration um, by integrating some smart features. Um, so Arvin, do you have an example on, you know, a feature for eliminating hardware? Yeah, just to kind of highlight a little bit more about what you were saying. It's, it's important that as we make our designs more simplistic for the end user, it just means more work for us in the back end to ensure that the product is well designed. Uh, sometimes, uh, and in terms of eliminating hardware, we're looking at a lot of snapshot features, things like that, and uh, it's often used in plastics design. Let's go ahead and look at an example here of a snap fit. Uh, now this snap fit buckle example um, we want to make sure that we have adequate force to push this down and kind of go into that groove, but not too much force um, where is needed where uh, a consumer can't do it. And if it's too little, then maybe uh, we see some of the high stress areas and uh, that might break off. So we want to make sure that we have a detailed design and take all of these considerations into account. In this case, we've done a 2D simplified analysis where let's go ahead and look at the stress and animate it and you can see how, uh, so this is going to help us decipher how much pressure we need to apply such that that buckle goes in and goes in place and then comes out as well. And not only that, we can also see what is the amount of stresses that develop as you move through this mechanism. So uh, once again, as you go into more detailed design, you want to you take a lot of these into account and make more informed decisions on some of the design choices that you have. Hmm. So it's kind of like a, it's like a buckle for a car seat where you want to be able to unbuckle it and buckle it, but you don't want your child to be able to unbuckle it. So Absolutely. Okay, so um, 
finally, we're, we're kind of wrapping up here. So uh, another thing is appearance consideration. So texture is really important. Um, so texture disguises your flow marks, parting lines, and reflection. So sometimes, you know, texture is on your side, and, and we do texture. It's basically once you're what once you've cut the mold and once you've decided that your part is exactly the way you want, you know, you might have uh, done a prototype, you've done some analysis, and now you're happy with your mold and the way it's cut. Uh, texture is a secondary operation. Um, so it's really important that your design is finalized because any rework that has to be done to the mold, you also have to retexture it, and that's of course an added cost. So texture can be on your side, but a lot of people aren't making the decision on texture until later down the road, and that's a problem because some really aggressive textures require more draft, and if you have cut the mold with maybe a three degree draft, but you're texture requires a six degree draft, then you might be in trouble. So you want to consider your texture early on. One more thing to keep in mind is <clears throat> while textures, um, you know, some of those considerations are good, another thing to keep in mind is you could potentially have textures for ergonomic purposes so that you have good grip when an end user is using it as well. Yeah, good point. Um, another texture, oh yeah, but don't go crazy on that, that's what I was saying. Okay, so another consideration is color. Um, so, you know, with neutral colors, like anything in the gray scale, those are real, those are usually easier to match between batches. So, um, let's say your first production run is a thousand pieces, and then, okay, your product's taking off and you need to make 5,000 more pieces. Well, you know, if you ask for a specialty color, it's going to be hard to really get that same exact formula. Um, if, if you do get it, it takes some time to get there. So that's one consideration. Um, neutral colors are easier to match between batches. Um, and then also it's hard to get a rush order with specialty colors sometimes. So that's a consideration. So yeah, all in all, we spoke about best practices for plastics part design. We spoke about the injection molding process itself. We spoke about making small changes to your design to make use of some of the benefits of injection molding. I would like to thank you for your time today. This is Ami and Arvind uh, from Go Engineer bringing you plastics part design. Mm -hmm.